Heavenly Father, we are grateful that we can be here today. Thank you, Lord Jesus, that you have shown your love to us so clearly on the cross. Uh, Thank you that you have taken your life up again from the dead, showing us the reality of what comes for us, uh, not only uh, at, at, a, at a distant future point in time, but, but the reality of, of what comes uh, within us as we receive you. We pray that today as we turn our hearts and minds to your worship, that uh, we would truly see you, what we do would be for you, and we ask this in your name. Amen. All right. So today I'm going to read Psalm 73. Psalm 73. God's way, God's ways vindicated. God is indeed good to Israel, to the pure in heart. But as for me, my feet almost slipped. My steps nearly went astray, for I envied the arrogant, and I saw the prosperity of the wicked. They have an easy time until they die, and their bodies are well fed. They're not in trouble like others. They're not afflicted like most people. Therefore, pride is their necklace, and violence covers them like a garment. Their eyes bulge out in fatness. The imaginations of their hearts run wild. They mock and they speak maliciously. They arrogantly threaten oppression. They set their mouths against heaven, and their tongues strut across the earth. Therefore his people turn to them and drink in their overflowing words. The wicked say, how can God know? Does the Most High know everything? Look at them, the wicked. They're always at ease and they increase their wealth. Did I purify my heart Did I purify my heart and wash my hands in innocence for nothing? For I'm afflicted all day long and punished every morning. If I had decided to say these things aloud, I would have betrayed your people. When I tried to understand all this, it seemed hopeless until I entered God's sanctuary. Then I understood their destiny. Indeed, you put them in slippery places. You make them fall into ruin. How suddenly they become a desolation. They come to an end, swept away by terrors, like one waking from a dream. Lord, when arising, you will despise their image. When I became embittered and my innermost being was wounded, I was stupid and didn't understand. I was an unthinking animal towards you, yet I'm always with you. You hold my right hand. You guide me with your counsel, and afterwards you will take me up in glory. What do I have in heaven but you? And I desire nothing on earth but you. My flesh and my heart may fail, but God is the strength of my heart, my portion forever. Those far from you will certainly perish. You destroy all who are unfaithful to you. But as for me, God's presence is my good. I have made the Lord God my refuge so I can tell about all you do. It's the word of the Lord for the people. Thank you, Jim. Well, this, this week, beginning this week, we are, we're back to normal. Uh, we're picking up again in 2 Corinthians after having... Um, been in the, the couple of different places that we were for Palm Sunday and for Easter Sunday. Uh, but again, we're in 2 Corinthians this morning. We'll be looking at chapter 6, verses 3 through 13. So if you have your Bible, you can open there. Uh, if you need a Bible, the white book on the tray in front of you uh, is the one you want. And as we come back here uh, to where we left off a few weeks ago, I just want to remind everyone again that we're in a section of this letter where Paul has been dealing with some specific issues affecting the Corinthian church. Uh, The issue here, uh, as it has been the last several times, is the presence of false teachers within the community. Uh, These particular people are criticizing Paul's ministry And they're basically saying the hardships that Paul faces actually detract from the appeal of the gospel. So they're they're saying Paul's a bad witness, right, because of the things that he goes through in his life, the things that happened to him. Who would ever want to follow Jesus if that's what your life was going to look like? right, so they're saying that um, uh, these things actually keep people from wanting to come to the Christian faith. 
In this section, Paul responds and he, he makes these basic points. He says, my ministry is not a stumbling block to people following Jesus. I have made myself a servant of Christ just as Christ made himself a servant to us. I'm open and honest about my life no matter what the circumstances are. And human weaknesses are actually opportunities for it to be clearly shown that the power operating in us is God's, not our own. Uh, So I want you to have those things in mind as we read. And beginning here again at uh, verse 3 of chapter 6, Paul is speaking and he's dealing with these issues. And he says, We give no opportunity for stumbling to anyone so that the ministry will not be blamed. But as God's ministers, we commend ourselves in everything, by great endurance, by afflictions, by hardship, by difficulties, by beatings, by imprisonments, by riots, by labors, by sleepless nights, by times of hunger, by purity, by knowledge, by patience, by kindness, by the Holy Spirit, by sincere love, by the message of truth, by the power of God, through weapons of righteousness on the right hand and the left, through glory and dishonor, through slander and good report, as deceivers yet true, as unknown yet recognized, as dying, and look, we live, as being disciplined yet not killed, as grieving yet always rejoicing, as poor yet enriching many, as having nothing yet possessing everything. We have spoken openly to you, Corinthians. Our heart has been opened wide. You are not limited by us, but you are instead limited by your own affections. I speak as to my children. As a proper response, you should be open to us as well. All right. You know, the question has came to mind for me. Uh, have you have you ever been turned against somebody by another person? Right. Think about uh, your own experiences. Have you ever known somebody who otherwise you would have thought, well, they're a good friend and they're trustworthy and they're they're faithful and. Uh, and, and basically someone who, who just tries to do what's right and good, but you got turned against them by someone else. Right? Have you ever had someone come to you and start telling you things about that person? Uh, kind of pointing out, well, they do this or they do that, and you know what that means. Is they're really thinking this or they really have this motive? Right? And they started kind of poisoning your mind. Has that ever happened to you? Well, maybe that hasn't been done to you, but have you ever been the person who did it to someone else? Or have you seen it take place? Right? Maybe you weren't the two parties involved, but you watched it go down with somebody else. The reason I bring this up is because this is the situation for Paul. The Corinthians have no reason not to trust him. They have no reason to think things about him. But there are people who've come in and have started saying things about Paul. And it's caused some in the church uh, to think very negatively of him. <clears throat> uh, as, as I mentioned uh, previously, there were these false teachers or false apostles who had come in. They wanted to kind of carve up the church for themselves to gain their own supporters. And one of the ways to do that is to attack the leader. You know, Jesus says, strike the shepherd, right, and the sheep will scatter. Uh, One of the criticisms that's being leveled against Paul here is that his life and ministry, as I mentioned, actually hinders people from coming to Christ. It's one of the things that they're saying about him. So Paul has been put in this position of having to defend his ministry, and that's what he's doing in this section that we read here. 
Uh, beginning at verse 3, Paul insists, look, the way I've conducted myself and, and the, things, the things that have, have happened to me are not a stumbling block to anyone. All right? He says, we give no opportunity for stumbling to anyone so the ministry won't be blamed. You know, when Paul says we, he's not only talking about himself, he's talking about those who work with him, uh, Titus and Timothy, Silas, uh, Apollos, those uh, who, who work with Paul and specifically have worked with Paul in the church at Corinth. A stumbling block is a hindrance in this context something that would turn a person away from following Christ or would cause them to give up on the faith. Uh, Paul says, my ministry doesn't do this. Our ministry doesn't do this. You know, throughout the letter, Paul has been really open about the things that he suffered on behalf of Christ. You know, we get to a section shortly where he talks about the number of beatings and imprisonments and, and being stoned. Uh, he talks about uh, frequent dangers while traveling as he's going uh, around the, the known world at that time, taking the gospel where it hasn't been. Uh, he talks about uh, have, you know, being hungry, being cold, having sleepless nights, and so forth. And again, the, the criticisms being leveled against Paul are that his life, because of these things, hinder people from coming to Christ. And the reason you would have to infer is that um, this doesn't look like somebody who, who God favors. This doesn't look like somebody upon whom God's grace rests, right? These things wouldn't be happening otherwise. So they say Paul's a negative witness to the gospel. What they're saying is essentially Paul's ministry does not commend the Christian faith to anyone. Uh, beginning in verse 4, Paul says, that in everything uh, we, uh, uh, we do commend ourselves, right? As God's ministers, we commend ourselves in everything. Then in the remainder of verses 4 through 10, you can group this everything into three categories, which Paul actually does. Uh, painful physical experiences, verses 4 through 5. Character traits that only come from the Holy Spirit, verses 6 through 7 and human weaknesses versus God's power, uh, verses 8 through 10. As I mentioned, Paul is, is defending the integrity of his ministry from attack. He's showing what the marks of a, the life of a true Christian minister look like, and he's really answering kind of an unstated question here. Uh, you could put it like this. What commends a minister of Christ? These three categories represent three answers. Enduring difficulty, demonstrating Christian character, and not covering up weaknesses. Right. Uh, so I want to go through these and, and take a closer look at, at what is said about each one, uh, beginning here with the first. The Christian minister endures hardships. The Christian minister endures hardships. Anybody who's been in Christian ministry knows that. Uh, you know, it's not like everything in life is bad. Some things are actually quite good, aren't they? Not everything is a hardship, but it's not perfect all the time. You know, it's, life is not trouble-free all the time. Difficulties come. We know this ourselves, don't we? I mean, look at your own life. You can't say that everything's always been on the, on the you know, up, upward swing, right? You know, I've heard it said that as a Christian, you're in one of three situations. You either are in a storm, you have just come through one, or you're about to go into one, right? Uh, the calm before the storm, many of us know from the storms here on the Outer Banks, the calm before the storm is actually quite nice. It can lull you into thinking that um, nothing's really ever going to happen. It's just going to stay this way. Uh, but what's even better, I think, is the calm within the storm. 
that even when things uh, seem to be falling apart around you, uh, there, there's a peace or a calm or an understanding that this is going to be okay. The mature Christian learns to see and rely on God's grace in all circumstances, whether things are good or whether things are bad. Everything comes from the hand of God. Uh, in verses 4 and 5, Paul describes things that he's endured which are physically painful, right? Hardships by great endurance, by afflictions, by hardships, by difficulties, by beatings, imprisonments, riots, labors, sleepless nights, times of hunger. None of these things are figurative. They don't mean something else. They're literal. They're things that actually have happened to him. He doesn't put a lot of meat on the bones here. Um, but the book of Acts describes many of these things that happened in, in detail to Paul and to the other apostles. Uh, earlier in the letter, Paul wrote, and he said, Brothers, I don't want you to be unaware of our affliction that happened while we were in Asia and we nearly lost our lives. We thought that there was a death sentence within us and we were going to die, you know? Uh, Paul's open about these things. He, he tells them what's going on. But from a purely human perspective, hardship and suffering, it, it, it seems rather unnecessary, doesn't it? Something to be avoided, right? Um, affliction, no thank you, right? Uh, beatings and starvation, no, I won't take those, right? Uh, imprisonment, I'll pass. From a Christian perspective, however, we know that God is in control even if these things happen. Uh, when hardships come, it's actually God who has allowed them. Some people don't like that idea. Of evil doesn't come from God. Bad doesn't come from God. Well, if God allows it, that's not much different than saying He caused it, is it? Right? Uh, why? Why would these things happen? Well, they're for God's glory. They are for our witness to Him. They're for the development of our faith, right? And they're for the production of Christ's character in us. That's what they're for. Christ Himself endured hardships. He was afflicted for our sins. He was beaten and arrested. Uh, people rioted against Him, not just uh, on, on that Good Friday when the crowd was yelling, crucify Him, crucify Him, but there were other times too. Uh, if you'll recall, uh, there was a, an instance where the people wanted to grab Jesus and throw him off a cliff, right? Jesus labored, not only carrying the cross and bearing our sins on it, but he served his disciples. He labored for them. He labored on their behalf, and he still labors on our behalf today in heaven. Jesus had sleepless nights. He had times of hunger. He prayed so intensely in the garden that drops of blood came from his brow. Uh, while his disciples, meanwhile, were sleeping, weren't they? Uh, Jesus hungered for 40 days and nights in the wilderness as the Spirit sustained him against temptation. And even uh, Jesus refused food when there was work to be done. Uh, if you'll recall at the well in Samaria, he had sent his disciples off to get some food. They'd been walking all day. Well, when they came back, the woman had gone to tell everybody in town about this man she had met at the well. And as this flood of people was coming out, Jesus said, no, I'm, I'm not going to have anything right now. There's work to be done. Right? He said, I have food you don't know about. My food is to do the will of my Father. I mean, how many of us, given the chance to scarf something down before going into a long meeting, would say, no, uh, I'm not going to do that right now? <laughs> it's, it's, not, it's not normal for us. Uh, the Bible tells us quite clearly that the affections of this life, or the afflictions, I'm sorry, the afflictions of this life uh, are intended to produce perseverance, to produce endurance in God's children. And Paul explains this in Romans. We rejoice in the hope 
of the glory of God. And not only that, but we also rejoice in our affliction because we know that affliction produces endurance. Endurance produces proven character. And proven character produces hope. Well, what's the hope? Well, I know what's in store for me if I'm participating in the sufferings of Christ now, don't I? Um, James also says the same thing. Consider it great joy, my brothers, whenever you experience trials of various kinds, knowing that the testing of your faith produces endurance. And endurance must go on to do its work so that you may become mature, complete, lacking nothing. Right? The ability to endure affliction comes from God. And affliction should not be seen as some kind of uh, dis disqualification for Christian ministry. Uh, it should be seen as something that will happen when you're representing Christ. Right? Endurance produces proven character, and that character is Christ's character. Uh, the next point I want us to, to look at is that the Christian minister demonstrates Christian character. That might seem like a simple or redundant statement, right? The Christian minister demonstrates Christian character. What other character should they demonstrate? Um, I don't know. Have you, you ever wonder exactly who some Christian ministers are trying to be like today? Have you ever thought about that? I don't know if you've noticed this. I've noticed it. Um, but there seems to be like a certain look that's been adopted for uh, hip contemporary pastors, like the hip pastor look. And I'm not trying to get in, in, you know, into all the ins and outs of how people dress and, and, and criticisms of this or that. I'm, I'm just saying there seems to be a, a certain look that has developed, right? Why is that? Well, it's not anything new. I mean, there was a time when every pastor wore a coat and tie. That was the look, right? Some still do. Uh, the Pharisees widened their phylacteries and they lengthened the tassels on their garments. That was the look, right? Uh, but it just leaves you wondering, who are people trying to look like? Are they trying to look like each other or are they trying to look like Christ? Uh, there are many things that could be said about Christian character, but Christ, above all, made himself a servant. That was his look. Uh, the Son of Man has come not to be served, but to serve. Jesus washed his disciples' feet. He taught them God's word. He trained them for ministry. He served them. And... He gave his life a ransom for many. You know, Jesus' instruction to his disciples was, you are to serve others as I have served you. There's no greater love than this, that a man lay down his life for his friends. Whoever wants to be first must be last. He must be the servant of all. Right? I've given you an example to follow. You know, by receiving Christ, there's a change that has been produced in our lives that we can't, we can't accomplish. You know that? Uh, our minds and our hearts have been changed by God. Uh, we've become aware of our sins. We've become aware of our pride. We've become aware of our selfishness. We've come to understand our opposition to God, our separation from Him. We've come to understand our need not only for him, but for a completely different way of life, the one that he gives. Um, you know, we've come to understand God's forgiveness, and what happens through this is within us God produces his love, and he produces his character. This is what develops in the life of the believer. Verses 6 and 7 focus on this and spell out uh, what Christian character looks like. By purity, by knowledge, by patience, by kindness, by the Holy Spirit, by sincere love. By the message of truth, by the power of God, through weapons of righteousness on the right hand and on the left hand. 
you know, by contrast, the false apostles were all self-servers. Peter says that they uh, were always looking for sin, that their eyes were full of adultery. Uh, John says that they're liars who don't remain in Christ's teaching. Uh, Also, that they love to have first place. And Jude says that these men are like dangerous reefs. Anybody who goes out in the water understands what a reef is, right? It's under the water, and uh, if you're not aware that it's there, you know, your, your boat or your ship can wreck on it, right? These men are like dangerous reefs. They're, they're danger below the water, you know? Uh, he says, they feast with you, but they only nurture themselves. They feast with you, but they only nurture themselves. You know, the church, at least in this country, runs into the same problems today. We fail to look at the whole package together, right? We might say, oh, you know, this person has wonderful knowledge, right? Oh, how knowledgeable they are. They're, 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 they're so great. Um, but we fail to look and see if their knowledge also comes with love, right? Do they possess knowledge and love? Because knowledge of Christ leads to love. It doesn't just lead, any, it doesn't lead anywhere else. Uh, we can look at the one who brings new teaching and say, man, those are just awesome spiritual insights that, that they continue to bring forth. But we may forget to say, but are they the spiritual insights that Christ gave us? Have, have, have they re- actually remained in his teaching, or are they bringing something new or different that's not his? Uh, we can look at the one who takes charge and say, man, that's a leader, right? That's someone to follow, This person who takes charge of this or takes charge of that, takes charge of that new ministry. Uh, But we fail to see if the person who does that also takes charge of the lowest tasks. Do they do both? Right. We need to do a better job here in our churches, just like the Corinthians needed to do. We need to do a better job of recognizing that leaders are people who actually follow Christ. That's what makes them a leader. They're the only person who's going to lead you in the right direction is someone who's following the Lord. The one who not only knows, but who also loves. The one who serves, the one who is patient and kind, the one who tells the truth, the one who trusts in God's power. The one who carries only weapons of righteousness. They don't fight with anything other than God's weapons. That's God's man. You ever wonder, what are these weapons of righteousness? Uh, Ephesians chapter 6 puts a little more meat on the bones for that. The weapons of righteousness, they are listed out as the armor of God. Uh, I don't want to get into all the details of that right now, but I just want to point out that if you would look at that list, you would see that the only, of, the only offensive weapon, right, the only attacking weapon uh, that's in the list is the sword of the Spirit. Right? That's the Word of God. The only other weapon that you can actually hold in your hand is the shield of faith. Right? So if you're going to have... Uh, the weapons of righteousness in the right hand and in the left hand, the only thing that you can have is the Word of God and the shield of faith. The Word of God is the truth. The shield of faith extinguishes the flaming arrows that are hurled against you. Right? That would be the, the lies and, and the slander uh, that comes from the enemy. And so... If you're going to do your part as a Christian minister in fighting the way that God says is allowable to fight, then all you're going to do is speak the truth and trust Him to deal with everything else. You know, the fact of the matter is, uh, Paul's life was a model of Christ's. There's not, really, there's not really anybody in the Bible, there's not any human being in the Bible who is Jesus, right, except Jesus. But when you look at, um, uh, you know, the things that uh, we see about Paul, we see that he was a, a, um, 
uh, he was faithful, he was self-sacrificing, he was loving, he was serving, right? His life was a model of Christ in, in, in as much as, as any human being can be. But fiery darts were being hurled at him, and some of the folks in this church just didn't see it. They didn't understand what was going on. Uh, the very things that Paul had endured in order to bring the gospel to others, in order to bring the gospel to them, are the things that he was being criticized for. But as Paul is about to point out, Christian ministry is a paradox. It's a paradox of God's strength and human weakness. And uh, that's the, the, the third and final point that I'd like to make today is this. The Christian minister doesn't cover this up. The Christian minister doesn't cover up their weaknesses. You ever thought about that? Have you ever, have you ever felt like, um, I have got to make my life look perfect if I'm going to be a good witness to Jesus? You ever thought about that? Ever felt that way? If I'm going to be a good witness to the gospel, I need to look like I don't have problems. I need to keep certain things about my life hidden. I don't want anybody to find out about this or that that's happened to me or that has occurred or that, you know, because if anybody knew those things, my witness would just be blown. Right? You ever think that way? You know, Christians are not special in the sense that we don't have life problems. It's not like we won't get sick. It's not like we won't have tragic events occur. It's not like we're never going to be in a situation where we need help. Right? I can't do everything myself. I can't do everything perfectly. I don't have every single skill that could possibly exist within humanity. Paul has to go on uh, very shortly in this letter, in, in chapter 5, verse 10, and tell the Corinthians that he actually boasts in his weaknesses because this is where the power of God is displayed. He says, God's power is made perfect in weakness, so I'll boast in my weaknesses because my weaknesses are an opportunity for God's power to be displayed. In verses 8 through 10, uh, he gives us nine contrasts between human weakness and God's power. Now, before we look at those, I'll just something you know I'll throw in for free. Um, three is a significant number in the Bible. Nine is a triple three. That's a triple. That's that's a, that's, that's that's like so perfect, right? Uh, so we have here nine contrasts, right? Three sets. Of three, verses eight, nine, and ten, and in these contrasts, what's laid out um, is the 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 difference between human weakness and God's power. So let's let's look at those through glory and dishonor, through slander and good report, called deceivers yet being true. Uh, that could be also translated uh, genuine but being called imposters. Right, we're genuine, but we're being called imposters. Known, yet treated as unknown. Dying, yet we live. Disciplined, or beaten. Beaten, but not killed. Uh, grieving, yet always rejoicing. Poor, yet enriching many. Having nothing, yet possessing everything. These are stark contrasts. Through personal experience in pastoral ministry, I have seen uh, some of these things in a way that I would not have otherwise known. Right? I would have looked at this at one point in time and just kind of been like, okay, what's that, what's that mean? Uh, I've actually seen uh, the person who might be praising you today uh, saying negative things against you the next day. Right? The person who, who praises you today might be the person who's slandering you tomorrow. Uh, the person who you have cared for and ministered to uh, might be the one who uh, turns and goes the other way in the grocery store when they see you. Right? The, um, uh, you know, you're, you're, you're known to them, but they treat you as unknown. Uh, you may grieve so deeply that you feel like you're going to die. 
right? Yet God sustains you. You understand that uh, in some way uh, he's doing a work uh, even through this sorrow and pain. And so you rejoice in that. Um, some of the best advice that I ever got was actually from my brother. And it was before uh, Erica and I entered uh, this type of ministry. And he said, he said to me, Errol, just keep doing your ministry. It was a very simple piece of advice. Just keep doing your ministry. He said, you can't pay too much attention to the good things people say, and you can't pay too much attention to the bad things people say. You just have to keep doing your ministry. I think the, the lesson here for the Christian is this. Uh, it's not always going to be a cakewalk, right? You're not always going to have people who like you. Um, you're not always going to be in, in, in good situations, but you just, but regardless of whatever the situation is, you have to be faithful to the ministry that you've been given. You have to just keep doing it no matter what. Uh, the lesson for the Christian, <clears throat> I think, is very clear that um, if we're trying to hide the negative things that occur, then we're just being fake. We're just being hypocrites, right? Uh, if we're covering up our weaknesses, we're just being fake. In all the ups and downs of Christian life and ministry, we need to act with integrity. We need to act with honesty. Uh, if we don't, that's actually what's going to cause our lives to become stumbling blocks to others. You know that? Uh, the falsehood of our illusion is some, at some point going to get figured out. Uh, it's going to be discovered, and that's actually what's going to become the stumbling block. That's the thing that's going to hinder someone who's coming to faith, somebody who's entering the kingdom, that's the thing that's going to deter somebody who's trying to follow Christ. When they realize that the, 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 the whole time you've just been a phony. So I want to remind you here of the, the questions and answers that we started with. Right? What commends a minister of Christ? Enduring difficulty, demonstrating Christian character, not covering up weaknesses. You know, Paul's life with all its trials and afflictions was very different from the intruders in the Corinthian church uh, whose only concern was their comfort and prestige. We see how, how Paul has to deal both in the first and second letters with, with these things over and over again. Uh, the very thing that Paul was being accused of by these false teachers was actually the problem with them. And in verses 11 through 13, Paul makes it clear to the church, look, I've been very candid, I've been very open with you, uh, uh, and he, he's, he's really shown them his heart. He's, given, he's always given them a, a, a transparent look at the inside. He says, look, we've spoken openly to you, Corinthians. Our heart has been opened wide. The problem is not a lack of love from Paul or his co-workers. The problem is a relational issue with them, with their hearts. Uh, they've allowed their minds to be polluted by the slanderers. They've grown in affection for someone other than Christ. And this has actually turned them away from Paul. So Paul says to them in verse 12, You're not limited by us. You're limited by your own affections. And in verse 13, Paul, in, when, in many ways, like our Heavenly Father, calls them to repent. I speak as to my children. As a proper response, you should be open to us as well. You know, the only proper response for the Corinthians is to repent of their wrong thinking and their misjudging of, of, of Paul and his companions who've done nothing but labor for their salvation and to be reconciled to them again. Right? This is also the only proper response for any Christian who might be in that situation today. You know that? And I wonder if that's the case for any of us who are here. 
You know, is there a brother or sister you have a problem with? Has that problem come from the things that somebody has told you about them rather than from what you've actually seen through their own lives? And do you just need to let go of all the things that were put in your mind, accept that they are who they are in Christ, and love them, be open to them again? If this is you, will you do that? Will you do that today? If you're not a Christian, I I, I want to, to be very clear. God is also speaking to you today, and what he's saying to you is, come to me as a child. You know, God has not hidden anything. He's been completely open with us. We've all sinned and fallen short of his glory. There's no one who is righteous, not one. There's no one who always does what is right and never sins. We've all gone astray. Our sins place us under God's wrath. They will be judged by Him. They will be punished in hell. God is very clear about these things. But Christ has taken this punishment in your place. He has given His life on the cross for you, for your sins. He's been raised from the dead. And that has shown everything He did was perfect and complete, and the door is open. His hand is out. Will you come to Him? What we earn for sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. And God has demonstrated his love to us in this way, that while we were his enemies, Christ has died for us. The only proper response is to repent. The only proper response is to turn from your sins, to turn from your own affections, and to receive Christ. You know, coming to Christ is not the solution for every problem in life that you may want to have fixed. It's not going to solve every difficulty that you're facing right now. But it is the uh, solution for the only problem that matters, the only one that really has to be fixed. Our separation from and our hostility toward God. There is a need that each of us has for our sins to be forgiven. There is a need that each of us has for a new life to begin now. So as we close today, I want to leave you with this. Christ is calling you. And the question is, will you come? Right? And will you do that now?